Uh, okay, yeah, everyone can hear me. Um, so hi, my name is Madupe, um, and um, like you said, I'm here to kind of talk you through what it's like to manage um, user feedback and use that as an opportunity to figure out what kinds of things that you want to build for them. So just a little bit more about myself. Um, been working at the New York Times for about four years now, uh, the last three of which I've been the product manager for the Android team. Um, and in the year that preceded that, I actually worked in a position where I was a liaison between the customer service team and all of the mobile product teams, including iOS and um, mobile web. And so that gave me lots of you know, critical uh, front lines experience with having to talk to users and kind of understand what their pain points are and how to translate that back to the teams who then have to build the products that those users are using. I've also spent time over the last few years working as a teaching assistant for an organization called General Assembly. So if you're not familiar with it, it's an org that aims to bridge the gap when it comes to adult education uh, for various technical and digital skills. So they'll have classes like marketing and uh, learning how to code and product management. And so I once took a product management class there, and I've been a teaching assistant for that class a few times in the time since. So what are you going to get out of listening to me for the next 40-ish minutes? Um, hopefully, I'm going to convey to you why you should care about how you talk to your users in production in environments where other people are going to be able to see the kind of responses that you give. Um, I'm going to give you some frameworks for how to approach interacting with those users so that you can feel comfortable reaching out to them and you could potentially give these frameworks to other people on your team so that you can spread the degree to which people on your team are kind of um, interfacing with users in real life. And, um, give you some tips for figuring out how to translate the things that you're seeing into things that you actually want to build that users will find valuable. So for one of the things I want to emphasize is that as much as I talk about interacting with users in public, which implies that there's a corollary of interacting with users in private, there are no real private interactions with your customers anymore. Even if you're dealing with them in the form of email or in a call center where they're calling in and talking to your customer care representatives, um, those could obviously be posted on various media forms. But regardless of what you have decided your strategy for how you're going to talk to your users is, um, they will find various ways to reach you that you may not have intended. So, you know, you could decide, I want to have a Twitter presence and I want to have something on Facebook and I have like customer support handles for people to interact with, but they'll hit your corporate handle directly, um, they'll post about you in Reddit and then start a thread about why you're terrible or why you're awesome. And so that may be another avenue where you have to go and think about how you want to respond to this, because it may matter, both in the case of finding out more details about why they're reaching out to you in the ways that they are, and to kind of address any branding implications for this. So there are several teams at the New York Times. The Android team is just one of them. They have various ways of reaching out to users, but the primary way that Android does it is via Google Play and Google Plus. So as many of you in the room know, given that this is an Android developer conference, you can reply to uh, reviews that have been left for you in the Google Play Store, um, which I find really valuable. Um, and our team in particular also has a public beta channel. And so Google Plus is a mechanism um, that Google allows you to use to manage those beta channels. And I find our beta super, super helpful. Um, as you know, with Google Play, you leave a, somebody leaves a review and you reply to it, and the only thing that's visible to most people is the last review and the last reply. So any context for what else is going on there is completely lost. Now, very recently, Google Play has updated it so that you, the developer, can see the entire history of a user's um, reviews, but you can't see your whole history of replies, and of course, the wider audience can't see all of it. What's nice about Google Plus and that beta group is that everybody can see the whole conversation and get the full context for the thread, which is really nice. So 
Why should you particularly care about the ways in which you talk to your users in production? Well, I have a couple reasons. First, brand. So the example on the screen here is not of the New York Times. We're still kind of working through how we want to unify our brand story across all of our platforms and have a more consistent way to talk to our customers, uh, regardless of what New York Times product you're using. So I want to use Slack as an example, because they take a lot of care in making sure that every touch point where they hit a customer is really consistent with Slack's general brand. So here you've got some sort of error message related to the WebSocket connection. And um, you know, Slack mentions that the solution they give you, they only suggest to you now with great regret and self-loathing. And so for those of you in the room who use Slack, this very much feels like the kind of message that you would get from Slack based on what you see from their onboarding and the way they set up instructions in their menus and also in their error messaging. So the Ways in which you deal with the criticisms that may come to you in public forums is a really great opportunity to further your brand if your company has a brand voice already, or to further develop one if you don't have one yet. And the other thing I want to touch on is insights. And so we'll come back to this a little later in the presentation as well. But there are some things that are really hard to see in the data. If you're super focused on the kinds of things that Google Analytics tells you, or Localytics, or whatever thing you're using to collect data about your about your users, your data is only as good as your collection methods. So if there's something that you're not measuring that turns out to be really important to the user experience and how your uh, company is perceived by the people who use your products, relying only on the numbers is going to hide this from you. And so talking to your users directly, taking the opportunity to question them in these public forums as they reach out to you in them gives you a really great chance to pick up additional insights um, that you're going to use to like, shape your strategy. So let's talk a little more about your users. It's really easy to believe that they should be as easily able to use your products as you are. But as it turns out, that's not necessarily the case. Um, so the Nielsen Norman Group, which was started by Jacob Nielsen and Don Norman, who are um, user experience designers and researchers, um, they recently published something uh, that was based on an OECD study that kind of took a look at the computer skills of adults in various OECD countries. And so the adults in this data set were between the ages of 16 and 65. Uh, so we're going a little younger than what's considered adults in a, a lot of countries. But we're also leaving out the elderly people who may skew this data even more. And so what you see here is that you've got the countries on the bottom, and the percentage kind of represents the degree to which they were able to finish uh, certain skill sets that they were given in the test. And down here on the bottom, this gray area are people who basically cannot use computers. Now, I'm going to remind you again, this data set only goes up to people who are 65. So even in well, relatively wealthy countries, you have a relatively significant portion of people who just cannot use computers at all. Then you've got people who are below what they call an, a, a one. So the number of the kind of skills that you can do if you rate a one in your technology skills are basic things like being able to take all of the information on your screen and complete a task. Um, it does not involve you having to navigate away to anything. You don't have to interpret information. You don't have to look at implicit data and then make decisions. It's just all the tools that you need to solve a problem are on the screen, and you can do it. That's a one. And you've got this pool of people who are sitting below a one, and then this group of people in the one category. And you've got two, and this tiny sliver of people at the top of the screen fall into level three. Now, most of the people in this room probably fall into the level three category. Um, you can figure out how to deal with obstacles that may come up while you're solving a problem. Maybe you get a crash. Maybe an unexpected error comes up. Maybe a navigation element behaves in a way that you didn't expect it to, but that won't throw you off, 
and you can figure out how to complete the task anyway. Most of your users are not these people. Most of your users fall into the 92 to 95% of adults who will not be able to do level three things. And so it becomes super, 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 super important to remember that you are not your users. And the decisions that you make that are based on what you want to do and what you think is a good idea and what you think is obvious and easy may not be the case. So whenever you're making decisions, you want to keep in mind the degree to which the information that you already know kind of privileges you in a direction of ignoring the problems and the approaches that you're taking. If you have a workaround for something and you're consistently using said workaround, you forget how bothersome said workaround is for the people who have to use your products. And this is true even if you are creating products for a super technical audience because they don't know that the, what the assumptions that you've made about how to build and thus what you've left out and what you've left to be implicit information that they just get, what they're supposed to just understand from various patterns that products may have. They don't know what constraints you're operating under. They don't know what kind of implications other teams that work with you that are not your technical teams um, have and the ways in which those other teams work influence your product. They may have a very different mental model of how those things should work together, and thus they may still run into problems if you don't really understand who you're building for and why. So now we're getting to the meat of the talk. Given all that we've said about thinking about who your users are and thinking about the ways in which they do not know the information that you know when it comes to building your products, how do you talk to them in public forums? So we're gonna use the New York Times as an example for a lot of these. So I've got some um, screenshots of our reviews in Google Play um, and some of the interactions that I've had with our readers in um, our public beta. I've removed some of the identifying information to make it a little harder for you to go jump in, but I guess if you dig back far enough, you can go find all of these. Um, but that's where you may see some weird squares in these. So the first thing you should really do is assume that your users are operating in good faith. Like I've said before, you have way too much information about how your products work to really understand how your users perceive them and what kind of pain points they're eventually gonna run into when they use the products. So just assume that they're being honest with you, they're reaching out to you for help because they want to use your products, they want to get around what that problem is, and so do not take personally the kinds of things they say to you. Yes, some people are trolls, and we'll get there. But by and large, your users just want to use your product, and they're reaching out because they don't want to stop using it. And the problem is bad enough that they've come to you. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this as well, but by and large, when a user initiates interaction with our team, it's because they have an issue. Very few people are reaching out to say, I am perfectly happy, keep doing what you're doing. That, I love those emails, I love those messages, that is not the majority of people who bother to say something, especially if your product is a few years old and we're no longer in the, I just downloaded this and I'm giving you a review and I'm really happy about it. So, assume that they're operating in good faith and they wanna work with you to solve this problem. So in this example, we have a user who's asking us to bring back night mode. They're telling us that we use the, they use the app less um, because we took it away. So the Android team at the New York Times decided to do a um, total greenfield rewrite of our app about three years ago. Um, and as we were working through figuring out how to do that, we looked at our data and we said, okay, what percentage of people use various features? Because we can't rebuild everything or we'll be working on this rewrite forever. What is enough to ship with and then grow on top of that? And we decided that night mode was one of the things we would take away. And thus, we got messages like this one. Um, so as annoying as it can be to get the same kind of requests from readers or users, I should say, over and over and over again, just assume that they wanna work with you, they're reaching out to you because they like your product, maybe they even love your product, and they wanna work with you to fix it. 
Next, troubleshooting without condescension. So again, remember, users do not know as much as you do about how your products work or how they're supposed to work. I've also found um, that depending on your demographic, you may not realize the degree to which people do not know things that you take for granted. So one great example of this is pull to refresh. Pull to refresh exists in most Google products, and thus it could be easy to assume that most Android users would understand how pull to refresh works and use that as a means to refresh the content. Turns out that's not always the case. There are a lot of people for whom giving instructions about how pull to refresh works from our customer care team solves whatever problem they were having with our app. So don't take for granted that people know how to do all of the things you expect them to do. Um, another thing that you may want to, to do when you're giving this kind of feedback is like, be more descriptive about how a thing works. So take the hamburger menu. If I'm ever describing anything and I'm asking a reader to dig into our drawer because it's behind the hamburger menu, I'll never just say the hamburger menu. I'll say the hamburger menu, parentheses, the three lines in the top left corner, or the hamburger menu, the icon in the top left corner. And so I both find a way to not be condescending to people who understand what the hamburger menu is, but at the same time, don't make a reader who doesn't understand what it is feel dumb or feel like they have to Google, what is this icon? What is this hamburger menu? Instead, I've given them both this is the thing and also here's how to find it so that we can continue to troubleshoot. But you don't want to go too into the weeds on this. If you ask a reader, say, or a user, I should say, in an email, send me a screenshot of what you're seeing. Don't explain how to take a screenshot. However, you may get someone saying, I don't know how to take a screenshot. This is what my device is. Help me. And that's an opportunity to then take that next step and help them understand how to do that. So there's a fine balance there. You're going to meet it based on who your users are, you know that far better than this description could tell you about that. But taking the time to troubleshoot, running under the assumption that they do not know what you know about how this should work is really helpful. Also, the fact that you may have to go through these steps may be a hint to you, the places in which you want to put a little more thought into how you have built something, because maybe it's not as intuitive as you think. Next, be curious about your users. When they give you messages that are, are vague and weird, that to them is kind of, this is my comment, it's the end of the conversation, but to you prompts you to say, why do you think that way? What more can I find out about the situation in order to understand how to move beyond it? If you're curious about your users, you're more likely to initiate this contact to get more information. So in this particular case, I know the um, screenshot might be a little hard to read, but this reader is complaining about how stories are ranked in the Android app. Um, he, he insults us um, and says that it is something that is potentially being ranked by an inexperienced intern, which is obviously not the case. And so what do I do here? In my reply, I ask him to email us because I would like to know more information because while the Android team can't control how this content is ranked, that doesn't mean that we can't help solve this problem. In finding out why this reader feels this way about the content in top stories, it's possible that there is a client-side solution that we can implement that could help. Perhaps something like removing a story that's already been read or something like that. Or it's possible that once we get the feedback from this reader, I could give it to the newsroom, and the newsroom could change their strategy in how they rank stories, but it's hard to say whether or not that's going to be satisfying if I don't bother to ask this reader more questions about why they left this comment in three stars in the Play Store. So being really curious can help you get more information about how you want to move forward and build. Um, another example on the curiosity topic, um, this comment is vague and utterly useless to me. The UX is definitely not on the priority list. 
Well, I can say that UX is on our priority list, but I can't say why this user doesn't like the way the app is set up. So I asked them to email us. Um, so one quick trick that we had figured out, um, our customer care email is android at onmortimes.com, and I get CC'd on every email that comes in so I can read user feedback in real time. And we discovered that if we add a plus Play Store or plus anything um, preceding the at NY Times, it still goes into the proper inbox. Our customer care team still gets the appropriate email. I still get CC'd on it, but I can set up a filter that specifically looks for emails that are coming to this email address as opposed to the rest of our customer care um, responses. And what's really nice about that is that it proves that people who are not leaving reviews in the Play Store are seeing my replies to other readers and are putting in that email address in their inbox and sending a message. So I know that this is, and if like the comments that I make matter, and there are effective ways for other people to get their problems resolved, because they'll see one person left a comment saying X, I responded Y, and also email us at this thing, and they'll send an email. Or they'll see an unrelated thing, but their first prompt of, I have a problem, I want to leave a review, I want to find out if other people are having this problem, I see this email address, I email it, then we can tell that our Play Store strategy is effective and is helpful for readers. Next, apologize when you are wrong. So in all walks of life, this is more difficult than it should be, but so often, when people are reaching out to you, one of the things they want is an acknowledgement that their problem is real and that you believe that their problem is real and that it's worthy of being solved. Um, nothing is more frustrating than being told that your problem can't be reproduced and there's nothing I can do to help you. Um, instead, they want to understand that you understand that they want to use your product but can't because of some sort of issue. And one of the ways to make a person feel better is to sincerely apologize for whatever bug you have introduced. Um, you know, it's a really simple thing that helps people start to move past their anger and towards whatever your response is gonna to be to what is going on. So if you've done something, if you've introduced a bug, say sorry and then move on and help them solve it. Be as honest as possible. Notes it does not say be honest. You do not have to reveal all of your trade secrets to your users. And it may be that you have information that is um, not disclosable because it's a partner's information or another team's information or what have you, and that's fine. But figure out what those boundaries are and bring users in. They want to be part of this process. They want to be engaged with what's going on in your company, and I have found that readers really like understanding why we are making the decisions that we are making. Um, understanding the context for why the thing that they want us to build, we can't build it at all, or we can't build it right now. And it also, like the apology, helps kind of placate their anger because they have a better understanding of why this thing is happening. So to the degree that's possible, let your users in and be more honest with them. In this particular case, a reader was asking us about NYT Cooking, which is an app that we have for iOS and it exists on the web, desktop, and mobile, but there's no Android equivalent, and that causes issues when you open NYT cooking pages in web views in our native Android app. And so in, I didn't put the longer thread here, but here in talking about and explaining that, um, I was able to kind of get a gauge of whether a potential solution that I wanted to do for this problem to, to deal with a share issue was gonna be something that would be palatable to a reader. And the beta channel gave me the opportunity to do that. And all of the kinds of things I've been talking about today is what allowed me to build a rapport that gets those beta users excited to answer my questions so that I can learn how to better serve them. Address criticism even when you can't do much about it right now. So we're constantly, constantly getting feedback from our readers about advertising um, because advertising exists even if you become a subscriber. It's something we cannot help today, 
subscription revenue is a huge part of how the New York Times gets enough revenue to do what it does, um, but our users are necessarily not happy with it. And so rather than just kind of leaving these sitting in the Play Store, we make a point to kind of help readers know that because a lot of people don't know that. They think, oh, you have our subscription revenue? Great, that's fine, that's enough. But for right now, for how all of our business models work, it, subscriptions are not enough, advertising is important, so it's important for us to help our readers understand why they're seeing the experience that they're seeing. So I'm not saying that for every problem that can't be fixed that you should go and reply to it, but if you can, if you can find a palatable way to help your readers understand in under 350 characters why you're making this particular decision, you should attempt to. And last but not least, don't feed the trolls. There are some people it is not worth replying to. Absolutely not. Um, you may find that all you end up doing is drawing more of that negative attention to yourself, so it's best to just ignore and move on. Um, so about five years ago, I was an intern at the New York Times uh, while I was in grad school, and I was working on social media. Facebook was my baby. And one of my duties was to moderate comments that were on our Facebook posts. Um, I'm not 100% sure how it works right now, but Facebook gave publishers lots of tools to figure out how to do that moderation. You could set up automated things and you could do things manually. Around that time, there were a lot of flare-ups in the Middle East. Um, Israel and Palestine were actively in the news for various reasons, and so, we got floods of comments. It didn't matter if the article was about beach balls or if it was about traveling to Paris or some random thing in Congress that had nothing to do with international relations in the Middle East. Every post had comments about how we were either pro-Israel or pro-Palestine or anti-Israel or anti-Palestine and how it was a problem. Not sure how we can be both pro and anti all sides at all times, but okay. Those are the comments that we got all of the time and my job was to moderate it. And what a great tool that um, Facebook had at the time was it allowed you to hide comments without deleting them. And so those trolls could feel like their job was done they put the posts there, but instead, the posts were on, those comments were only visible to them and to their friends. And so, rather than further antagonize them, they did what they did and they moved on. Google Play, I think a really great way to go about this is to just like, let it go, don't draw attention, don't get into a cat fight on the internet with these people, and just kind of move on. Okay, so, knowing what you know, having some tools for how to address users in the Play Store, which will also prompt more people to write things in the Play Store because they know that you're gonna reply to it. They know this is a good mechanism for getting your attention and getting you um, to listen to their concerns and understanding that you are not your user. How do you go about taking the things that you get out of the Play Store and doing something about it? So, like I mentioned before, statistics only tell part of the story. I have no idea what went wrong in our look at night mode. It's entirely possible that the reason why our numbers were so low in the number of users who used night mode in the version of our app before we did our rewrite is because we were only tracking you turning it on or off or perhaps it was because we had buried the button to turn night mode on in a menu that most users didn't see. So our stats said one thing, but the response to removing this feature said a very, very, very different thing. And so we got a lot of comments, like the ones that you see on the screen. And so this is where the Google Plays and the um, Google Pluses and the Reddits and the Facebooks of the world become a really great way to get more information. It gives you those qualitative things that don't show up in the data that could then allow you to figure out, oh, is this another question I have to ask? Is this more research I have to do in a particular direction? Have I unexpectedly undervalued something because the way we have set up our analytics tags don't tell the full story? Really paying attention to what's going on when your readers reach out to you in production can help you pull these insights into your decision making. 
you want to make sure that you're buttressing that information against the demographics of your users. And so it's really important to do the work to figure out who your users actually are. Even if you don't have a user research team at the company that you work at, that's OK. There are, I'm not going to go over them in this um, talk, but there are plenty of tools online that can help you understand how to dig into um, the information that you have so you can figure out who your users are. Not all products lend themselves to putting people into buckets like the ones you see on the screen, um, but having a better sense of who is actually using your product can help you keep that user framework in mind when you then get indication of a pain point and you're trying to figure out how to solve it. Um, so a great way that this comes up all of the time is in dealing with fonts um, in the Android app for the New York Times. Most of the people who are working on the product either have good vision or have glasses that can get them to the point where they have good vision. And so they underestimate the impact of fonts that cannot be read as clearly or fonts that cannot be increased in size in all places. So those problems, we're still working through them. They exist in the app today. There are lots of places where you can increase the font size, and there are some places where you cannot. And by continuing to remember that the overall demographic of users who use my product are older than I am and are more likely to have vision problems, coupled with data that tells me that people who change the text size over index in the number of articles that they read, keeping those demographics in mind and the kinds of things that they say to us when they reach out allows me to continue to make sure that those needs are served, even when they're not necessarily apparent in the building process. So it's really important to do your homework and understand who is using your products so that that qualitative feed feedback that comes from these public channels is useful. Next, talk to your users. Make sure that you're talking to these people on a regular basis. It doesn't mean you have to set up big, detailed ethnographic studies where you follow a person for a significant period of time. It doesn't mean necessarily bringing them in for half an hour or an hour to talk to them. There are lots of micro ways that you can do continual user research to keep that qualitative feedback coming in and to keep retesting the assumptions that you have about who is in your audience. And so even if you don't have like, defined ways to do it, your users are everywhere and there are lots of ways that you can find them. If you are a B2B product, you can talk to your vendors and have a conversation about what their pain points are or what kind of problems they have and how they resolve them and you can use that to influence what you do in your products. Um, you can dog food your product with your coworkers if you don't have um, other users who already meet your demographics who you can show it to. Your friends and family are an option. Though you obviously have to be careful there to make sure that they're giving you real feedback and are not trying to um, tell you what you want to hear. So there are plenty of small ways. There's really no excuse for anybody who puts out a product to say that there's no one I can talk to about it. It is not true. And it also does not have to be something that is left to your um, user researchers or UX designers. Anybody in this room can take steps to better understand who their audience is um, in small micro ways using some of the techniques that we've talked about over the course of this time. And finally, before you build stuff, ask why and then ask why again. You want to figure out if the suggestion that's coming to you is a valid one. Users don't know all of the things about what's possible and all of the methods that you have to solve their problem. They just know, this is my problem, and then perhaps they think they know, this is a solution. So please, build this. Before you just decide, I'm going to build this, take into consideration all of the things that we've talked about, and then try to dig into whether or not this surface level solution or the surface level problem is really the problem. There are lots of times where you can take 
the thing that a user perceives as an issue and take the context in which they're coming to your product, put those together and discover that there's a deeper hidden need that wasn't immediately obvious until you asked more questions. So the example I have up on the slides. Perhaps, you get, perhaps we got a request saying, please remove all the photos for the, from the app. There could be a, lots of reasons why you're asking for that. Maybe you just want more density in the reading experience and you think our app is too visual. But maybe when we start asking you questions, your concern is data. Maybe we are eating up too much of your mobile data every month, and you think, hey, photos are a way that I resolve this in other apps. Some other apps have given me the option of turning off photo downloads. Maybe I should ask the New York Times to take away all the photos so that I can continue to read them um, without killing my phone bill every month. So in finding that out, maybe we discover that we have a data management issue that we need to resolve. Maybe we find out, here's an alternative solution. Don't load photos over data if a user has opted into not having photos loaded over data. Or maybe we say, we're not going to pre-download all images related to all content. We're just going to do a subset of images. Or we're not going to download any images at all, and you have to be online to do it, or you have to be on Wi-Fi to do it. And so we go from a request to have all images removed from the app to a solution that preserves the visual integrity of our experience, but still solves the problem for the users. So remember, you can take the information that you get from those users in qualitative channels, put those together with the demographics that you've learned about them, and a fundamental understanding that you are not your user, and use that to figure out how to craft experiences that really help those users going forward. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Thank you, It was a great talk. This was one of the few talks of today, to be honest, of which I understood each and every word. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Do you take questions? Yes. Yes. yes? So, uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, what do you think or what's your experience or the experience of the New York Times about in-app feedback? Like, for example, you shake the phone and something pops up and the user can write something there. Um, so that's in-app feedback is the primary way that we end up getting um, responses from readers. Like we have in um, a few different places in the app a send feedback button. Um, and I know that people are using that because when we do that, we pull in the device information, available memory, OS, um, your email address if you're logged in, um, the version of the app you're on. So that also is really, really helpful in me troubleshooting like what problems people actually have. So I find that to be an extremely valuable way for people to give feedback. Because I mean, that's, that's where they are when they have the problem, right? It's only if your app is like crashing on launch that that becomes an issue. Um, otherwise, making the, those really obvious um, to users is really important. And I would caution against something like shake the phone and you can do that, because the affordances that show people that you can do that may not be visible. Um, and so you reduce the number of people who discover that that's an option. So at, at a button explicitly says send feedback. Yep. Yeah. OK, thank you. You said don't feed the trolls. Yes. Is it obvious to you who is a troll? Because when I was reading the remarks before, like you don't care about UX. It would have already felt like a troll to me, but it, it wasn't. So I think this is where it becomes really important to not take the feedback personally. Like, go from the assumption that they're leaving you this because they want you to help solve a problem, and then act accordingly. But um, I can't speak for all industries that people's products may sit in, but you know, someone calling us fake news is very obviously a person I don't want to engage with. Um, and so you're going to have to use your judgment there, but the first step is like letting go of the idea that you're being attacked and you know, going from the perspective of, OK, how can I help you? Yeah, um, in the last couple of months, I've had it happen uh, quite a few times where I wanted to help a user figure out some problem. They contacted us via support mail. and. 
uh, they don't really seem to get any of any of the information I provide them with if I ask them uh, how, the, how did the bug happen, for example. Mm -hmm. How would you suggest handling such cases? Yeah, so often users don't know how or why a bug happens. So you can ask them, and it's really great if they can answer that question, but that becomes really hard. So that's where, um, where I mentioned in a previous answer, we get like all that device information. That becomes really helpful for setting the context in which all of the other things a user says to us um, comes into, so we can make more sense of that and see if we can try to replicate it. But that's also where it's like really important to use very, very clear language. The less jargon, in fact, as much jargon as you can take out, the better, because what you perceive as, I understand this term, a user may perceive as, I don't know what that is, so I'm going to skip it and ignore the instructions to kind of help with that. So that can help kind of dig into what may be going on. Okay, thank you. Next question. Hi. Um, you shown on your Google Play uh, answers to the users complaining mm -hmm. uh, that you often provide uh, an email link. I personally always feel like that looks like I would be shifting negative feedback to a different channel where others could not read it. Did you ever get anything like that, or do you feel like that's a good way to uh, engage the users further? And linking on that, do you feel that users that you engage via email will update their negative reviews afterwards? Um, so to answer your first question, um, even if it does feel like a little bit of a cop-out, I try to, as thoroughly as possible, answer the question in context, but Google Play only gives you 350 characters, and again, it's not a conversation. Like, they may say something, then you may write something, and then they may update it. It's only recently that you can see the history of updates, but you can't see your history of your responses. And so, just to have a cleaner experience of, like, potential back and forth to solve this problem, email may be better. So like, you want to make sure that you're not forcing a solution into a particular medium. Use the medium that's best for answering the question. For the second one, um, we do sometimes see that people update their um, Play Store review. So it's funny, you'll go back and their review will be, the New York Times helped me out, this was great, and they'll change the number of stars, but then the reply precedes the review and is talking about troubleshooting. So it's awkward, but um, I would definitely reply under the hopes that people update them, because they do. Not all of them do, but they do. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hi. I appreciate sharing your experience. Thank you for that. Uh, my question relates to when you said uh, know your users. So mm -hmm. what's your approach on knowing your users, uh, like in, in terms of you gave the example of uh, text sizes and uh, elderly people or younger people and so on. So how do you know your users? Um, yeah, so um, I'm lucky that the Times has a research group that can tell us a lot about who are using our products um, because there are a lot of broad similarities among the various platforms and they can also dig into via surveys and in-person research more details on the ways in which the users on particular platforms differ from each other and how their satisfaction levels differ from each other because they'll use um, um, NPS scores and tools like that. Um, NPS is a net promoter score which um, brands can use to get a sense of how positively or negatively people feel towards a particular brand. And so we are regularly measuring the NPS of the New York Times as a whole and of like the iPhone app, the desktop website, the print products, the Android app. And those numbers are um, sometimes really different for different demographics. And so we do a lot of like heavy survey data, but you do not have to have a full research team to learn more about your users. Um, sometimes we'll run um, an ad that's really a house ad, a New York Times ad, and if you, it'll say, we'd like to hear more about your opinion. And if you click on it, it won't, instead of opening an ad, it'll open a browser that has these surveys in it. So there are some low-touch ways to kind of figure that out and get more demographic research so you can make better questions. And then me reading all the feedback gives me a really strong sense of what are the common problems that people have, and it helps me discover what are the ways in which I thought this was an obvious solution to a problem or an obvious 
I'm having a problem, I'm gonna do this, and it's like how I discovered that pull to refresh is not as obvious to my users as I would have thought, because people will say they have a problem, will reply, have you tried this? And they'll say, oh, I did it, and it worked. So they clearly didn't try it before. And so the ways in which we assume they are able to use our products aren't necessarily the case, and like paying attention to that feedback can help you uncover that over time as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I would like to ask for one more success story from your team where you could learn from your users and adjust your directions and then you see an impact. One more success story? Yeah, if you have something in mind. Um, let me think. Um, maybe. Um, so Brian Plummer over here is one of the developers on my team. Um, another success story based on what we learned from users. So I know that um, a lot of readers were having trouble figuring out how to turn notifications on and off. Um, and we know that because, and it's not a fully solved problem. We still get emails from like, somebody gets a notification and the email is asking us how to turn it off. Well, given that the setting exists in the app, if you're emailing me asking me that question, clearly it's not nearly as discoverable as it should be. Um, so we moved it up from like, two layers down in our settings into our overflow menu, um, and that reduced the number of people asking that question, but it's still the case. Like, I think another thing we need to potentially do is put that option in two places, or we're eventually gonna get rid of our overflow. We're like overhauling some navigation stuff, and so it'll sit in one place, so people are more likely to travel along the journey to I want to change something, let me go to the settings, and it shows up where they expect it to be. And so, you know, it's, it's funny that you think, let me just put it in front of people on this menu and they'll find it, but they won't. There's lots of like funny user blindness in that regard. So we definitely reduce the number of people asking us about this setting, but there's more work that we can do there. That's pretty obvious, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Modupe.